Hello and welcome to the first episode of Unfiltered. My name's Ian Byrne and I'm joined by the two great men, Willie Mason and Rennie Matua. Bernard. So one of the first things that I think we noticed recently that really did annoy us was the treatment of uh, State of Origin player Tim Glasby. He got picked in his first State of Origin and, uh, and he gets hit with the image you see behind you, um, basically saying he's a shit player, he doesn't deserve to be there. Now, for any player playing State of Origin, it's the biggest moment of your life and you are ecstatic, your family's ecstatic, your friends are ecstatic, everyone's happy for you and then you've got to cop this shit. Now, that to me is horrendous. Now, you're both ex-players, you've copped some shit in the media yourselves. What do you think when you see something like that? I've only copped a little bit, so um, <laughs> uh, I think it all stemmed from the, from the, after the first game. You know, when, when they just said, Nate, big forehead Miles has had enough. You know what I mean? Like, that's some sort of personal, some attack. personal attack. It's like, okay, we can hand, I can handle you saying stuff about my game. You know what I mean? Because that's our professionalism. You know, mm. if you're playing bad, cop it, cop it. That's, that's, that's the journalist's job and that's what they do. But if you personally attack someone, it's just like saying I've got a big chin when I don't. You definitely don't. <laughs> exactly. So no, what, are, what are you looking at? Small what are you shit. looking at? Don't but turn I mean, side on. But that's the same thing. I mean, like, that's just, like don't, I said, I can cop you saying, look, hey, really, you, know, you, you, you played disgraceful, this, this, this. I can't do anything about that because I know myself I played bad. Yeah. But if you personally attack me, that's, that's a total different the thing. Too far. And then I look at the Glasby thing and I'm like, Damn, this this kid, that's his this is probably the best day of his life. Yeah. And you ruin it. I mean, like, I, I he got the last laugh because Queensland won. Mm. But they that's like some sort of bullying, you know what I mean? It's, it's ridiculous. I was like, he can't, can he play? Can he run hard? Can you can no, 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 no. Like, what are you doing? I mean, Ren, you you had like a I mean you had a very successful career, but you also had a checkered career in terms of events that are outside of football and, and you cop some shit in the media as well. I mean, that affected you on a personal level and that people don't think about that. Like they just see you as yeah. a player. I think, um, you know, a lot of my issues were warranted, but you got to peel it back and, and think what, what's their agenda, the media, and it's to sell papers. And we're talking about it right now. So mm. in a way they're getting their point across because we're having a conversation about it, but w personally attacking someone's image or, or um, you know how they look or anything like that. It's just it's just garbage media. Um, the, the, the whole thing is is to be able to have an opinion on a person's sort of performance, and you, they, you, they can openly do that. But when you per, you know when you make it personal about what they look like, that's when it's just. Is that the media? Shit. Is that the media just clutching at clutching at straws because they're just not selling as many papers as they were ten years ago? Print media is dying. Know? Print media is dying. Yeah. It's all social media. It's all it's all about that, and it's like. They've got to come up with some sensationalism, sensationalist bullshit that's yeah. going to really shock everybody well, by personally attacking came. someone. Well, they don't put their name to the story, do they? They didn't put that. Didn't have the balls to put their fucking name to the story. That's bullshit. Yeah, and that's obviously, what me off. yeah, and obviously you're worked up, and, and that's the thing, especially when you have a personal relationship. Like you played with Nate, and you uh, won a comp with Nate, and, yeah. and he's a good mate of yours. And to see someone getting attacked on he a personal a level, it, hey, he didn't win a comp with us, didn't he? No. That's research. <laughs> that is research right there. I know who won the so, with us. Basically, if you look at it from a personal level again, and it's a human, people, we're all people, you know, and everyone, everyone has their limit, and I just think it's too much. If you went, take they, another they cross example. They the line, they cross the line. If you take another example, that big Samoan kid um, who just got hammered yeah. for being big. I mean, all he was was big. I mean, admittedly, the, the, the debate was about whether or not it should be weight versus age, but if you've got a kid, he, he's probably... They reckon he was 100, 100 kilo. kilos. He'd be playing against 14 year old kids. He's seven years old. Rennie's 100 kilo. His first grade is under 100 kilo. Yeah. Do you want to play him against? Do you want to play exactly. the kid against grown men? Yeah. But the, the the name, the whole thing is like you're shaming some young eight year old kid. You know, as as I go back to bullying and this whole society thing, this whole world now is all about not bullying kids and depression and how it leads down this dark road. Like if he turns out to be a thug, a gangster kill someone, does some shit real dumb, like it all, it all form back to whatever you did to him when he's eight years old. Mm. You know and what it, I mean? Like it's, it's, a, it's, it's a ripple effect. You know, you think this is not going to harm this kid for the rest of his life? He got named and shamed in papers, he's on a current affair and all these other media outlets. And he's the worst part is he stopped playing footy. He stopped you playing. Know, he, it's the only he, thing that he loved. Seven year old kid. Probably come from church, young Samoan kid, probably come from church, playing his game, having fun with kids, 
wasn't absolutely bulldozing anyone. He's just playing his game. Mm. Now he's stopped playing. That's ridiculous. And this is a new thing because, I mean, I was a big kid. I was, I was oversized and, and, and I, you know, went through and was playing rep stuff, obviously, at an early age because I was bigger. It definitely wasn't my skill level. Yeah. So, but then, you know, that, that's, I mean, that's 30 years ago now, obviously, but there was no talk about it. Then all yeah. of a sudden this is becoming a, a, a topic where the kids should be too big and, and it's getting driven again by the media, sensationalism. Well, I mean, it comes back to the editor at the, at the end of the day. They've got control over what the journalist prints or whatever they speak about. Um, they need to take accountability for what they do. You know, you don't know, as Will touched on, what sort of life they're going to leave after they might get some publicity about and getting bullied. So it's about the journalists, journalists taking accountability and learning some language to use when they write their stories or when they speak their stories because they need to sympathise with the with the person, unless they're stating facts. Mm. If they're stating facts, then fair enough. But it's, if it's opinion, that's when it gets a bit too grey area-ish for me and, and, you know, I can't really sort of support someone that's sort of just having an opinion who's never possibly played the game or never had, you know, never been bullied in their life, so. You know, with NRL players, obviously it's different with that little eight-year-old kid, you know. With, with the NRL, obviously you sign a contract and they own your image, they can put whatever they want about you on the papers, in the papers, on the news, where, wherever they want. But it has to draw a line somewhere where it comes to... Do they own your image? Is that what happens? Yeah, they own our so you're not intellectual property. To, that, that? That's why we don't have our names on our back and we can't make any money off whatever we do. So, yeah, right, I didn't know. Which, is, which sucks, know. but that's right. a whole different matter. Learned but I mean, show, right? Yeah, but, <laughs> but as, as I said, I mean, like, you do sign up to cop criticism, but not personal criticism you know like you can you can easily cop stuff if you if you if you fuck up in just say if you, you DUI assault all this kind of garbage that happens drugs all this sort of stuff that does happen in sport you're gonna wear it but yeah. I mean I just think they're just gonna draw a line where somewhere they just can't really you know really hammer these people personally mm. I guess I, from a different perspective and this is I'm leaving it open like are we too sensitive as well you know what I mean like with in the developed world with technology and and how easy information is accessed, yeah. are we too sensitive? You know? well, I don't think NRL players are sensitive. They, they, that, you know, the young Glasby just copped it. He didn't come out and win. Yeah. You know, like, it's just, I'm just my point about them overstepping their boundaries. Yeah. It's not like I don't give a shit what they put out about me in my whole career. Mm. It just didn't faze me. Yeah. And same as with you because you, I'm real to myself. I always knew what I was. I, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I was always, I knew my family loved me and that's, and my mates love me. That's it. I'm not going to go out there and just try and impress everyone. I think the issue is that you've got a situation where everybody's talking about mental health and are you okay day. And, this and there's is some it. great this is society. Now. There is there's some really good initiatives to try and make sure because men traditionally don't speak about their feelings. They don't no. let things out. So if you've got a situation where we're trying, on one hand, we're saying, all right, everyone needs to talk about their feelings. Everyone needs to be honest and open if they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, you're holding footballers up as these gladiators that should just cop shit off wherever it comes from. It's 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 not right. It's you know? not a contradiction. There is. Not. It's yeah. a contradiction. You, you get situations where you've got mental health rounds in the rugby league that are that are promoted, but then you've also got situations where blokes are getting hammered because of having a big forehead or a massive yeah. chin. Not that that's ever Who's happened. That? Who's that? <laughs> But, you know, it's, you can't have those contradictions. You either have it one way or the other. I understand what you're saying, that it might look as if people, were, you know, you should cop it. Mm. But realistically, should we? Well, the media aren't employed by the NRL, so they can do whatever, whatever they, they want. want. It's their agenda to sell papers, be shock jocks and, and say an opinion. And, and mm. you know, that's just it comes with the territory, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't agree with it, but it's not going to stop. So speaking of current players and, and the way the rounds are going at the moment, we're obviously getting to the business end of the, um, of the NRL season. Um, mm. You blokes obviously won a comp and now um, you've got, you're, you're pretty well positioned to be able to talk about these last rounds and what they mean to, I guess, the finals and, yeah. and, and the way it's going through. I mean, if a team's going like a busted now but they're at the top of the comp, are they finished? If a team's coming home strong... Does that mean they're a chance of, of going further than you expect? I mean, what, what do you think? I think if you're coming home strong at this part of the season, this is where you're a real threat. Like Parramatta, for example, they've won like six in a row. They've had two buys. haven't been beaten in about nine weeks. So they're a real dark horse. But I, mean, I know we're going to touch on Melbourne. Melbourne are the team that are just so clinical. And they've got, they're just like they're playing for something else, you know, with Cooper obviously potentially retiring and, you know, Kevin Smith coming to the end of their career, will they have another opportunity to be in this mm. position? 
it's just like they're going to a whole another level. So Go they're on. a scary fucking team at the moment. Going back a little bit from what you said, how important do you think the run is now? Like when we won the premiership in 2004, the run into the semi-finals, just say from round 23, I'm not sure if you remember. Yeah. I don't really remember either. There were some good times <laughs> there. But we didn't really get, we didn't get beat in the last four rounds. And we were putting some points on some teams. I think we put like and then we end up rolling in and getting done by North Queensland, remember? Mm. That sort of just checked us straight back into gear. And it's like, okay, well, we're not the world beaters who we think we are. Maybe is a loss important coming up? Or do you need that? Do you need to win 10 in a row and just keep going? Because I, mean, I think a loss somewhere along the line really checks you. Yeah. You know, like what, what, what we did in 2004. And sometimes you just go, oh, we're killing it, we're killing it. And you come up against a team. Just say you might come up against the Raiders in the next three weeks. They're on fire at the moment. They're coming home strong. Boom. You play against Canberra. Melbourne's got to play against Canberra. And they might dust you up. Then if it you, really gives you a big reality If set. you're finding a ways to win and then you're not really the better team on the day, but you're finding ways to win, that's when a loss might be, be good for a side yeah. because then you can reevaluate where you are. But if you're playing really well and full mm. of confidence. You, you don't want don't any care. doubt in, their, in your brain. You don't care. You don't respect any opposition. So you don't really want a loss. You want to just keep rolling with it, rolling with it, build confidence, yeah. build combinations because you might get an injury. You know, Bevan Frenchie's out for Parramatta, which mm. is a huge loss. So they've still got four rounds. But I, I think for me, Parramatta is like one of the only teams that could probably challenge Param uh, Melbourne at the mall. They're a bit more yeah. unconventional. They're not expected They're to win. They're tough. They're playing for each other. They're a niggly sort of annoying team at the mm. moment. You know, Brad Arthur's got the best out of his players, but... I think you, you touched on it before, like with, with Melbourne. It looks like they're going to a new level. Mm. And I'm just trying to figure out why until you just said, like, you know, Cooper's gone. Yeah. You don't know if Bill's going to play on. Mm. Cameron's probably only got, you know, two more... Cameron could play for the next 10 years. Yeah. But I mean, like, you don't know. So something's... They want to leave a legacy there yeah. that is just undeniable. I reckon as well this year, it's probably the first year through the origin period that Melbourne haven't, I mean, they normally traditionally they lose, they yeah. lose, they get hammered because they've got no players, you know. Mm. But this year, it looks like the players have got around them seem to be holding up that. Yeah, well, I know, think they, it's, it's, young it's, kids, it's perfect got, when you've got, you know, uh, about five or six Kiwi internationals in your team. That doesn't hurt. It does help. Yeah. It does help. And I mean, yeah. like, I think that helped us for Origin when we were, when we were playing. We had Roy, Sonny Bill, Matt Utai, all these sort of blokes, you know, just sort of holding the helm there. And, yeah. Um, it does help, and you know you got that you know a Safa Solomona who's just a beast. I think he's going to be an Who, animal. Who's the Jordan new McLean, the new the halfback coming through, Riley he's, Jack. He's, yeah, I mean like yeah. Andrew Jones. Just <laughs> jo <No>? <laughs> Joey, just the depth they've got. Mm. Like I went to the Melbourne Roosters game down in Adelaide, and I thought it was Cooper Cronk actually playing, but it mm. was that Riley Jack. So they've got so much depth. They've got their youth. You know that monster. He's a freak. He's just a freak. Yeah. He's strong through the hips. He's awkward. Great hips. Great hips. Mm. Magnificent looking hips. <laughs> oh, some great, <laughs> great quads. <buns>. Great quads. <laughs> um, I've been stalking you, monster. So, they, yeah, look, they're going to be completely hard to beat, but they'll, they want to get you into that structured game of grind footy. Yeah. But like, that's I what I said. I don't think they play that anymore. Mm. They've, got, they've got that a little bit of structure, when I think, but I think people got on it. They know when to go out of it. They got onto it. Yeah. And now they know where, okay, we've got these big young kids that just want to play football. Mm. Belly's going, get on there and destroy yeah. these other guys. You know, so you're getting this other, this, these new breeds coming on. They've got offloads coming out their ass. Mm. They're just flicking it everywhere. And they're playing off the back of that. But before, I think, when they got, you know, cost themselves in the grand final and stuff like that, was when they were too structured and people were buying onto it. It was just like the Bulldogs when they, when they just went from, you know, like this team in 2012, mm. tip, tip, pass, out the back, out the back. They're still they're stuck in 2012. Still doing the and same thing. And people and people are bought onto it and it's going, bang, that's closed. But Bellamy and the players that they got down there can just evolve and just go to that next level. So that's what's dangerous about them. I'm watching yeah. them play and they're aggressive as hell. They're beating the shit out of some forward packs, which usually you can try and get over the top of the Melbourne forward pack because they were just, you know, just workers. Now they've got some dudes that'll put you on your back. So you've heard it here first, Melbourne can't lose. Well, I didn't say they can't I think lose. Oh, it's now theirs, we're all it's, no, it's, no, it's, 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 it's theirs no. to lose. So it's theirs to lose. It's theirs to lose. Sharks. Brisbane, Sharks. On their, Brisbane on their day and Sharks on their day. And a full strength Roosters. Well, you two have had more clubs than a, than a golf. I think bag. I played for all them. I think you played for every club. Then there. Kings Cross, <laughs> <laughs> Sapphire Special. Oh, yeah. But I mean, look, I think realistically, if you look at Melbourne, I'm prepared to declare them. I can't see anyone. Um, I can't injuries, see anyone beating them. Injuries and something like a ridiculous play like Fafita last year. They had that game. I mean, they 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 should have won that game. They'd be still stern about 
losing that game. So yeah. that's going to drive him. The, the loss of Cooper Cronk and all that kind of stuff is going to drive him. So that's what I'm saying. Like when Ren said, they're going next level. But you look at Origin as well, going back to Origin, how Melbourne have skated through that Origin period, all right. But then you look at, at Cronulla. Maloney's been busted since Origin. Um, Fafita hasn't done much since Origin. Um, you Bird's, know, injured. Like, Bird's injured now? I, I feel like Cronulla really, t- it t- the Origin period really took a toll on Cronulla. Mm. Um, it's luck. It's luck. And, and that's... I mean that's not their fault. It's just that it was a it was a it's a torrid series. It can either make you or break your Origin series. I mean, yeah. like, because if you if you've got a team like Melbourne or Brisbane, you know they're always going to have five or six players, obviously key players in Origin that are going to be playing football the whole time. You know, like Cameron Smith plays eighty minutes, Cooper Cronk plays eighty minutes, Billy Slater eighty minutes. All their forwards are playing fifty to sixty minutes, and it takes it out of you. It's like three grand finals in the middle of the year. Mm. You know, and to come through that unscathed and to have your pe- uh, to have the boys win games through it, it's just a bonus. I mean, yeah. like, I was lucky and blessed enough to play in, some, in, a, in a good club, a great club at the Bulldogs, where we could come back after Origin and still be in the top four. You yeah. know, so it's very important. I mean, like Brisbane, you know, they've lost McCulloch, they've lost a few players, but relatively unscathed. Are Brisbane a chance? Massive chance. I think, I mean, the loss of McCulloch is massive because he's such a, he's an integral part of that team for the last 10, 10 years. And he's got a calm head on him like a Cameron Smith. But um, I just think Ben Hunt, the transformation from him, you know, leaving the club as well and then going into nine. And he sort of changed the game last week. But he was involved in like four or five tries. He's only on for 45 minutes and he killed it. So I reckon now if you look at the top sides, you're saying outside of Melbourne, you're saying Cronulla, you're saying Brisbane Roosters. Roosters, yeah. And I think, I think my Smokey, obviously, is Canberra if they get into the eight. Ooh. Parramatta and, Penrith? and a Penrith, yeah. Penrith coming on. Mate, yeah, Regan Campbell Gillard, I reckon he'll get picked in the Aussie side. I reckon he's the next best. You thing. like hyphen names. RGH, no, is that right? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Regan Campbell Gillard. Rick, it is. Uh, so well you, whatever. My Smokey's Mel, uh, Manly. Melbourne's not a Smokey. Manly? Man, they're my Smokey team. Mel- to, oh, win the Manly? Well, to win the comp. Manly? Well, I comp. think they can win their last four games. They've got... A, Fairly decent run home. I reckon yeah. they can jag those four wins, go into the finals with plenty of confidence. Who wants to play against the Cherry Evans that's playing well, you know? They've got some good players. They've, they went through a period where they were winning a lot of games. Yeah. Lost those two. Barrett was under pressure. And then they come out and, and smack... smack um, put some points on the Roosters. On the they? Roosters. Would you, you say know? the turning point for Manly as a club was not re-signing Willie Mason? Oh, absolutely. They just it's went really from strength been, it's from to strength. strength, to strength. The club has left just the club. really Every gone club on. he's left has gone from strength to strength. It really has. Apart from the Bulldogs when they got wooden spoon. <laughs> 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 Whatever, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, look, personally, I think... How many think... wooden spoons you had? No, uh, one. Ah, bullshit. What, one? Roosters, Cowboys. Two. Two. There's two. Two more than me. Two more than me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so Melbourne, I think, are going to win the comp, and I think you can put it down to their players that they've got, obviously the Smiths, the Cronks, and the Slaters. Speaking of Cameron Smith, realistically at this stage, there's been a fairly significant debate about uh, the Immortals and who should be the next Immortal, where we're going to go with that, you know, whether or not eight's enough, whether they're going to just drip dry one or two a year. Um, I think realistically there needs to be some pretty clear guidelines on the immortals and what it means. Or also they need to, Willie's been talking about this for a little while and I've had to listen to it for many years, is a hall of fame. You know, I obviously go to a lot of reunions and stuff like that and talking to Danny Badiris and all these sort of other players. Like, and you have a look at some of these great players during the 90s like Bradley Clyde, Laurie Daly. If you th- how do you be an immortal? They're not, they're not going to be an immortal. Darren Lockyer probably won't even be immortal. But, I mean, like, there needs to be some sort of system like the AFL, like the NFL and the NBA and all that kind of stuff where you can be, become a Hall of Famer. Obviously, you've got to put up the right numbers and be the right player and all that kind of stuff. But then you've got to go to that next level where you're an immortal, like Andrew Johns. Mm. I mean, now Meninga should be the next one. But, I mean, how, where's the criteria? How do you get into to, to be an immortal? Is I mean, there like, a criteria? I'm not well, sure what it is. I mean, w- through, so many, through so many eras, like... <laughs> Is Danny Badiris not one of the greatest yeah. nines? Is yeah. like Cooper Cronk, Billy Slater, yeah. like Brett Kenny, Laurie Daly, me. Bradley Clyde, Ray Price, mm-hmm. Ricky Stewart, Alan Langer. Like, do they do they not belong in some sort of place where they get recognised as the best in that era or whatever? You don't have to be a fucking immortal. You can't be an immortal, but they they need to be recognised as the best players in their era or wherever it was. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you can't just let these players slide because they need some sort of recognition. Imagine you feel like Bradley Clyde's, you know, 
great great grand grand grandson. He's playing rugby league. Oh yeah, my you know my granddad you know it was Bradley Clyde. He's a hall of famer. How good was he? He's a hall of famer. Mm. Oh how good was he? Wasn't it? Oh he was pretty good. He played like two three hundred games, twenty origins, twenty tests, cup the grand finals. Oh you don't really know how good that is. Anyone can sort of not anyone can sort of slot into that, but to put people in a hall of fame would mean so much to a lot of players. You know what I mean? And but to become an immortal. You know, in the last, what, 20 years, like Andrew Johns has been the best player in the world. Now you're coming against guys like Cameron Smith, JT, you know, like all these other guys. Do they, do they belong in there? Is, is Cameron Smith an immortal? Lockie. Is he? Is Darren Lockie an immortal? Mm. Malman Ninga's not an immortal. Mm. Four kangaroo tours within four years, 40 tests, 30 origins, captain, three, three premierships. I yeah. Google. What about no, just, Statsman? No shit, mate. Stats, Statsman. Dave Middleton. He's done his research. Hey? No, I didn't, it's just straight off the dome. Look at that. Oh, no. No, you're right. I I mean, you, need to recognize, <laughs> you need to recognise more players within the game. And, you know, for example, you just said Brad Clyde. He won a Clive Churchill in a losing side. Yeah. How many people would do that? 20 origins, 20 tests. Hey, he was certainly one Free of like, the best back rowers to play, ever play the game. He's one of my favourites. So Hall of Fame makes sense. Yeah. You know, get, rid of, get out of this old sort of system that we've, we're, we're living in and bring and, in the Hall of Fame. And you know what? When does it – how far do you go back? Do you go back to 1908? Well, no, no I don't remember well, anyone there. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, how, when do you start the Hall of Is Fame? Is Daly Messenger one? I don't even know that. I'm asking, happened. when do you start no, the Hall not. of Fame? From 1960 onwards? Well, Clive Churchill, I Well, guess. from whenever it was bloody televised, I know, for rugby league, you know, when was it on TV? I mean, you just want in the Hall of Fame, eh? He wants you should in the be Hall in there. He no, should I be. think, I think the characters be. within the game. Yeah. No, I think there should be a criteria, like how many, like, games you play, what you do for the game, tests, origins, premierships, everything like that. But obviously with, with the, with the NBA, and all, you have to be retired for five years. So yeah. let all the shit slide what you've done off the field. <laughs> and everyone can start, I'd be that <laughs> start, rem start remembering from what, what you do on the field like they do now. I'd be but that I mean, Hall of Fame, I think. Yeah, but I, I, <laughs> no. think, I think there's, just, there's a place for it. And I think rugby league, there's been thousands and thousands of players that have played the game. And, you know, you get your mediocre, you get your average, and you get great players. And then you get your immortals. One of the greatest wastes of time and one of the hardest things anyone's ever going to do in, in, in terms of a debate is to say who's better from one era to the next. You know what I mean? You can't compare. Like you can, there are yeah. so many things that change. The game changes. Yeah. The training changes. The, everything changes. I the just, sports science changes. I, I can understand what you're saying. So I think a Hall of Fame, if you can have a blanket over saying, all right, well, if you've reached a certain criteria, you know, yeah. then I why think not? maybe they should start it from 1970 onwards. And if you, if you put some criteria in there, so be. But then you're going to have people that are going to have the argument, started from 1908 because that's when the comp started. But no one would like... Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, like, imagine if you were that great-great-grandson. Oh, my dad made the Hall of Fame. So you're saying for the family, I'm that's for the it's family, for the family. I'm for the yeah. family and friends and stuff like that and, and for their personal gratitude. And a lot of them guys obviously passed away. Yeah. But then just to say, look, he was, he was a Hall of Fame player. Mm. You know, go from go from the fucking start, boom, all the way through. It's going to take you a long time, but just make sure there's a criteria, and I'm pretty sure you can go through every era and come up with something. I think the guarantee of this year is that no one really in this current Bulldog side is going to be an immortal because <laughs> they cannot beat an egg. Now, you blokes are both Bulldogs legends, I'll say. Yeah, I'll say legends. You'd say legends. Immortals. Immortals. Immortals, you can be an immortal. Yeah. We've just set up our own guidelines. So well, you want to, you're an immortal. Hall right? of Famer at least. So essentially, um, you know, obviously the place is a lot different from when you guys were there because you're old now. Yeah. You know, it was a long time since you've been No, it was, there, it was a long time for me, but not this kid. Yeah, that's true. Because, I mean, I, I want to ask you and myself because obviously, you know, I was there from 98 to 2007. That's a lot of success for I, I still love the club. And a lot of, you know, a lot of support, a lot of people, you know, direct message me on Instagram, tweeting, all this kind of stuff about what's happened with the club, what's happened with the club. I don't know personally what's happened with the club, but, you know, because I, I left so many years ago, but you were there in 2014 with, under the Des Hasler regime. So from 2004 onwards, you know, you left in 2000, after 2008, 2009, then you went back 2014. What the fuck has happened? Without, uh, you know, the playing group, the work ethic was still the same. The ethic was still there. But from someone who'd played 100 first grade games plus 50 flag and reserve grade games there, I came back there and I felt like a complete outsider. And that was not because of the, not being accepted by the players or anything like that. The place had changed. It mm. was just not the Bulldog culture that I was, that was bred into me. You know, when I came to the club as a South junior, it wasn't long before I, bought into the Bulldogs 
environment, bought into the culture. I knew everything about every ex-player. I knew what it, every player did through the 80s and, and the legacy they built through the 90s and then into the early 2000s. And I was lucky enough to come into a system in the 04 uh, and win the grand final in 04, but Canterbury had been building towards that. When I went back in 2014, it was like I'd never ever played there. It was different. And that was just the way that I guess Des and the place wanted to be run. I don't think they wanted to have any sort of history with the club. Des Hasler is a manly person with a bulldog shirt on. Yeah. You know, that's his vehicle yeah. to be successful as a coach, to be at Canterbury, but he will always be manly. Mm. If you take him into a room and you held him at gunpoint and said, who do you go for? He's going to say, I'm, gonna, I'm a manly person. What about Northern Eagles? No. No, just manly. <laughs> okay. and I'll, I'll give you my little Des, Des Hasler um, little taste. I mean, I was at, I just, just after my manly stint, there was talk that I was going to go to the Bulldogs and I had a meeting with Des Hasler. And I was keen, you know, it, was, it sounded really good on paper. Oh, you go back, play your 300th game for the club, blah, blah, blah. I was just like, yeah, it sounded really good. But like, okay, let's, let's just talk a bit of, bit of footy. And Des comes, you know, we meet him, I meet him um, in, in Darling Harbour or some crap like that. We have a coffee and we just start talking about football, just in life in general. And he just, bang, put out this big book. Oof, about that thick. It stats on everything. Everything. Like, every, like from, from fucking day dot. I mean, like... In his, in his eyes, I don't know if they're twisted or not, or his head or football's just got to him. Aiden Tolman was the best prop in the game, and to me, no disrespect to Aiden Tolman. I was thirty five. I still dust him up. You know what I mean? Like I just and hello to like, Aiden Tolman if you're watching. Yeah, what's Tom's up, Aiden? Right. How you going? Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Like in my eyes, I'm like no Sam Burgess, you know George Burgess at that time. Yeah, they were killing it. But he, I said, do you ever go by the eye test, Des? And just go look, look at the look at what he brings, what sort of emotional sort of presence, a physical presence, and what sort of drive that the guy has on the field, and how much he can get people going with him, you know, mm. the leadership skills instead of you know finding your front on the play of the ball, you know, tackling forty five times. There's a reason why you tackle forty five times if you're a front row because you're a spot player. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, yeah. you don't get run at. I don't get run at fifty times a game because I would hope to think that I could actually tackle all right. Mm. But at that stage, it really, really put me off rugby league and pretty much forced me to France. Yeah. That was pretty much the end of. I remember when that happened. And I told you. Back from the it done my head in. Yeah, it did. I was yeah. like, I, I, I think I don't know how to play football anymore. Yeah. Mm. Look, the way, <laughs> the way Canterbury playing. France is, seems so good right now. Can I go to the south of France and retire, please? It's, Thank you. It's just, it's just the way. It Sorry, does, can I, and the, the, the best thing he said was, "Go to France and enjoy the last year." That's the thing, and I have so much respect for Des. But that was the best thing you said the whole meeting. Mm. Well, look, I mean... And you met for two hours. It basically leads into... <laughs> we talked for a whole... And we talked for a whole day and had 20 beers. Look, he's, he's a super, super intelligent human and I think he's... Too smart. Too smart for rugby league. I just think you need to peel it back a little bit. You need to have your team fit and then you need to have them... You don't need to give them so much information. They're rugby league players. When you overload them with the information, that's just typical of the way they're playing now. They don't go out there to intentionally lose. But they just... They're so confused. That's the way I watched them last night and they didn't know what to do. You know, Sam Cassiano's getting the ball on the fourth tackle, or the fifth tackle, where's mm. the half? Or It's just so much information driven into the players. I feel sorry for them, they've had a, a terrible year, and, and I, I don't know if it's worth keeping Des on long term for that club. I think it, things are gonna just get worse. It's not like he inherited that team, he's picked every single one of those mm. players in that team. And if they're not getting results, then you know, you gotta be accountable for it. I think analytics is massive in basketball, NFL, and that's where he's at in his head. You know, he's, he's doing metres after, after, the, after the tackle. All these little, little things that's like, that coaches don't really give a shit about. And as Ren touched on, it's not, it's, and the game hasn't evolved that much. You run hard, you tackle hard, you have more, more fight. All these, all these little things will win you a game. Completions, all that kind of stuff. You can go into that kind of, you know, that sort of st st statistics, but not the stuff that he was ripping out to me. I was, I've never heard of these stats. You I've can't even say statistics. I, don't, I can't even say statistics. 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 And I didn't know what, so I didn't know what he was talking <laughs> at the start. So like, it was, um, yeah, it really threw me off. I was like, man, what, what are you doing to these guys? How do you say that to a front rower? Because I remember at the time you were actually quite excited about going back to yeah, the Bulldogs. Yeah, it felt like it was, a feel, felt a feel like, good story. And I know, Ren, you, you were the same when you were going mm. back. It just felt like a really nice way to oh, finish look, your career, to give back to the club. Yeah, I don't regret going back there. No. It's just things were different. You know, And like you got to mentor some young kids And that's another thing and, what Ren, Ren told me. He goes, it's totally different. Because I told Ren, I said, I'm going to meet Des. And he goes, 
it's not the same. I said, and I knew it wasn't going to be the same. And that's what I don't like. Whatever I did at the dogs is my legacy. That's it. I yeah. want it to stay there. I don't want to change. I don't want to go back. And it would have. It would have changed. Well, when yeah. the comp, something like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs>